Hello, I'm Steve Fluharty, Dean of Penn Arts and Sciences. The recent killings of George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, Breonna Taylor, and Amon Arbery, along with other incidents of racial violence, have shined a spotlight on the painful reality that many in our community have long been aware of, the enduring legacy of racism. Their deaths and nationwide protests have not revealed anything new, but instead have made it so that the general public cannot look away from the shameful truth. In an effort to amplify the messages of the protests, we're presenting a special series, What Happens to a Dream Deferred, 60 Second Lectures on Racial Injustice. 60 Second Lectures have been a Penn Arts and Science tradition since 2003, with faculty taking literally a minute to share their perspectives on a variety of topics. This set of short talks will spotlight the history and contemporary manifestations of racism in the US, black lives and culture, and the range of factors that have contributed to this moment. The series title comes from Langston Hughes's 1951 poem, Harlem. It begins with a question, what happens to a dream deferred? Many of us are familiar with the next line, which answers with a question of its own. Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? But that's only one of several possibilities Hughes offers. He wonders if a dream deferred might fester or crust over or sag like a heavy load. The final line of the poem asks another powerful question, or does it just explode? When we consider recent events in our country, we must not think of them as a response to a single incident. They are the response to centuries of dreams deferred. And now I will introduce today's speaker. Mary Frances Berry is the Geraldine R. Siegel, Professor of American Social Thought and Professor of History and Africana Studies. Her talk is titled, Show Not Tell That Black Lives Matter. Next, we have Margot Natalie Crawford, Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn Professor for Faculty Excellence and Professor of English. She is the Director of the Center for Africana Studies. She will speak on unapologetic Blackness. Finally, we'll hear from Herman Beavers, Professor of English and Africana Studies. He'll discuss the ubiquity of white literary rage. I would like to extend my personal thanks to all of today's speakers. And please follow Penn Arts and Sciences on Facebook and Twitter for the next edition of What Happens to a Dream Deferred, 60 Second Lectures on Racial Injustice. Thank you. How much more evidence do we need that police enforce white supremacy? The murder of George Floyd comes after thousands of killing of black folk by the police in the last decade alone. Karen, like a modern day slave patroller, deploys her knowledge of white power when she calls the police to arrest black people, picnicking or bird watching. It's the lynching story we visited. Black people know black lives matter, even while dying disproportionately from COVID-19, working in unsafe conditions as low paid essential workers, as homeless or dreading eviction because of non-payment of the rent. Black Lives Matter means that reforming the police will not be enough. We've been in that movie before, in 1935 in Harlem, in 1943 in Detroit, in 67 in Newark, in 92 in South Central LA, in 2014 in Ferguson. And every investigation called on governments to reform the police and to reduce poverty and racial inequality to little avail. However radical the demand to defund the police sounds, it is still only a minimal reform compared to the justifiable demand for reparations. Some type of community policing is necessary for controlling crime, but we need more money for housing, jobs, mental health programs, schools, parks, and food. Having politicians, corporations, and institutions pay lip service to the need for change is not enough. We've seen that movie. 
only persistent agitation will prevent a perpetuation of racial inequality in our country. Will those white allies who put their bodies on the line to protect black protesters also put their privilege on the line to end economic and racial inequality? That is the movie we want to see. Signs carried during the Black Lives Matter protests remind me of Bob Marley's lyrics. They got so much things to say right now. They got so much things to say. One sign carried by a young Black woman reads, respect Black lives like you respect Black culture. As the photograph continues to circulate through social media, the image of this young Black woman and her words on the cardboard are delivering a very clear message. Don't disconnect my words from my body, my lived experience, my Black identity in constant formation. In the academy, people continue to lapse into the practice of making Blackness an object of study disconnected on the page and in the classroom and in everyday life from the people who call themselves Black. This most alive current movement, Black Lives Matter, has a lesson for the academy. Black studies, as many scholars continue to emphasize, reimagines the very category, the very meaning of human. The issue of mattering is a minimum. Black studies does not only matter, Black studies unsettles, Black studies disrupts, Black studies imagines what is not yet here. The founders of Black Lives Matter made unapologetic Blackness one of the movement's key principles. Unapologetic Blackness is also the mood of the most radical and vibrant zones of global Black studies. The radical Black imagination of the 1960s that fought for Black space within the academy paved the way for the Black Lives Matter movement. Unapologetic Blackness was the spirit of the 1960s and early 1970s Black power and Black arts movements. During the Black arts movement, there was an explicit focus on the need to make sure that Black culture was not made into an object of study within structures that marginalize Black people. The great attention that has been given to the diversity of the protests should not make us forget the movement of Black self-determination that was created as the Black feminists and queer founders of Black Lives Matter set this revolutionary energy in motion. Revolution is a state of liminality. The not yet here is held and felt as the tilt, the pivot, the radical change begins to occur. Toni Morrison knew this liminality of the revolution that would make black flesh not just matter, but be loved. When she and her novel Beloved imagined an older black woman, Baby Suggs, preaching in a clearing in an open space of the emergent. Baby Suggs' sermon delivers unapologetic love of black life. Morrison writes, and all my people out yonder hear me, they do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck, put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it, love it, and the beat and beating heart, love that too. More than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air. Toni Morrison's words still matter. It is time for free air. We must breathe. Gwendolyn Brooks in her poem, Riot, writes, in seas, in windsweep, they were black and loud and not detainable and not discreet. The loud, not discreet protests that is happening now in cities and towns in the United States and throughout the African diaspora should make us pause and feel a renewed, recharged sense of the mission of global black studies at Penn and throughout the world. In a moment so fraught with images of racial injustice and social upheaval, it's easy to think that the scale of the protests, which are occurring both here in the U.S. and abroad, indicates an inflection point, a sign that racial discontent has reached levels that signal substantive changes in the way that Black communities are perceived and policed. But such a conclusion diminishes the fact that African American history and literature is rife with examples of black bodies being subjected to racist violence. What I would like to emphasize 
is not only the violence, but the ubiquity of white rage. We cannot talk about ending systemic racism without confronting the specter of white rage, a subject that seems never to be far from instances where racial animus turns violent. As a critic of African-American literature, I suggest that the work of African-American writers is replete with examples of the ubiquitous and seductive power of white rage. The first is the title story of James Baldwin's 1965 collection of stories, Going to Meet the Man, which features a flashback in which a character recalls being taken to see his first lynching by his parents as a small child. Caught up in the carnivalesque atmosphere of the lynching, the child experiences a host of emotions. Quote, he turned his head a little and saw the field of faces. He watched his mother's face. Her eyes were very bright. Her mouth was open. She was more beautiful than he had ever seen her and more strange. He began to feel a joy he had never felt before. He watched the hanging, gleaming body, the most beautiful and terrible object he had ever seen till then. Well, I told you, said his father, you weren't never going to forget this picnic. His father's face was full of sweat. His eyes were very peaceful, end quote. Robert Hayden's poem, Night, Death, Mississippi, written in 1962, gives us three speakers, one an old man too inf old and infirm to accompany the mob. In part one, hearing the victim's cries in the distance, the old man goes out to stand on the porch and muses, quote, be there with boy and the rest if I was well again, end quote. Hearing the victim's cries once more, he thinks of his son's participation in the violence with pride and concludes, quote, have us a bottle, boy and me. He's earned him a bottle when he gets home, end quote. In part two of the poem, we hear the voice of the old man's son who declares, quote, Christ, it was better than hunting bear, which don't know why you want him dead. And as the poem comes to a close, we hear the voice of the younger man's wife in four compactly arranged lines as she states, you kids fetch Pa some water now so he's can wash that blood off him, she said, end quote. What is striking in both examples is that the white rage that turns into murderous violence is rooted in quotidian behaviors, a lynching that is also a picnic, mob violence as a transgenerational practice a reason for a father to be proud of a son, the handing down of white supremacist attitudes from one generation to the next. What comes through in these examples, and the countless other examples I could cite, is that white rage is both an affective circumstance, where the faces of snarling and screaming whites whose anger is focused on a black person who refuses to stay in her place, and an ideological one, where the mechanisms of the state are harnessed to prevent black progress. Whether it be violence aimed at individuals, Emmett Till, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, or George Floyd, or at communities like the Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Forsyth County, Georgia, whites who decide to inflict murderous violence on the bodies of black citizens do so because they believe that they have the moral authority to do so. In other words, white rage, be it from a mob, or a police officer. Its criminal behaviors notwithstanding is perpetrated by people who see what they are doing as located outside the realm of criminality. For them, it might be a commitment to patriotism, loyalty, or order, but its aim is to confirm white supremacy as a form of common sense. If we are to engage the question of how to combat systemic racism, I submit that an awareness of the pervasiveness of white rage is essential. <laughs>